Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. Today we've got Jordan Feigenbaum on the show. Jordan is a strength coach at Barbell Medicine and also has a medical degree and residency training under his belt. Jordan, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. So for the folks who may not be familiar with your work, can you just give us a bit of background on yourself and how you got into all this health and fitness stuff? Uh, Sure, yeah. So um, I got into lifting probably 2007, 2008. I made mean, my first competition uh, shortly thereafter for powerlifting. And so I, had, at that point, loved training. That was my thing. And it was interesting because at that time on the internet, there's like very few things that you could even like find. Like I recently did a podcast with Mike Tushare and we were like, yeah, the only things you could read were deep squatter and like elite FTS. That was the only thing on the internet. So, um, yeah, but I would just consume that stuff voraciously. Anyway, I graduated, uh, started coaching people and was ascending the ranks, at least in my own mind anyway, uh, through, uh, <laughs> the, through the strength conditioning field, you know, acquiring new certifications and getting different, um, you know, uh, positions where I would, uh, teach people how to coach. And at any event, it became clear to me that no one cared what I was saying. You know, I, I mean, I think anybody who's done either personal training or coaching realizes how important the stuff can be for like health, quality of life, preventing disease or, or, or managing disease in addition to medications or whatever, if they're necessary. Uh, so it's abundantly clear for, to those in the trenches, but at the top end, like at the medical professional level, like these people are like, uh, I don't really understand how this works. They don't see it, you know, or they don't have enough time to even like to talk about it. Cause again, it's always just, just walk more or whatever. So, uh, and I was like, well, if I could just connect with all these medical professionals, you know, man, we could really do something. That'd be great. Uh, it's like my, you know, uh, I'm going to do something good here while, while, I'm, while I'm around. But they didn't care what I had to say because I was just a trainer, right? So I thought, if I get more education, then they're going to listen to me. So the things that were accessible to me at the time, I could get more certifications. I could get more accreditations, more letters after my last name. Uh, but nobody cared, really. I mean, pe- people were, oh, wow, you have a lot of education. That's good, you know, in the training field. But nobody was like – beating down my door from like a, a, a medical school or like a hospital say, hey, will you come talk to us? So I thought, you know what, let's just go get a medical degree. Because because then what I thought was, well, if this training thing goes belly up, like if for whatever reason, you know, the market implodes, I needed a backup plan anyway, right? I mean, <laughs> I, had a, I had a biology degree at the time, and there's nothing you can really do with that uh, so training was going well, business was going well, but I figured, you know, worst comes to worst, I could be a doctor. Best case scenario, these new credentials, people are going to listen. So in any event, uh, I had to go back and get a master's degree uh, to kind of shore up my resume to apply to medical school. It was super, super uh, competitive in the States. So I got a master's in anatomy, physiology. I was still lifting, still training. I think the when I completed my master's was the year I ended up going to the Arnold for powerlifting, qualified and, and did went there. And then... Um, yeah, I got into medical school, uh, and then it was so funny, man. I, I remember I was like, I, I had this brief thought: I'm gonna go ortho. I'm gonna be with bones, muscles. They make a ton of money. I don't even need to do this training thing anymore. I could do, the path to you know has been set before me. I can just go ortho. And then I was like, oh, this is. I mean, you're helping people, sure, like, but one person at a time. And I was like, no, no, I don't even. I don't love that enough to make that my life. So I, I realized like very early on in my medical training that what I wanted to do was bring fitness uh, and str- like strength conditioning in particular to the medical world and the medical world to strength conditioning because I think both sides can benefit from each other um, from the strength conditioning standpoint, the ability to evaluate evidence uh, and sort of piece together sort of what we know from the scientific literature uh, and empirical data uh, to like formulate best best strategies towards you know, uh, out training outcomes uh, or health outcomes, that's useful. And then from the medical side, like, hey, there are actually, there's a lot of benefit to uh, getting your patients to train or change their nutrition or both at the same time. So I was like, oh man, there's huge, huge upside here. Um, so yeah, after I completed my medical uh, degree and went through, you know, in residency, and I was like, all right, we got to we got to step on the gas, which is where we're at now. I mean, we're really trying to like put out good content and get into the medical mainstream. So, this latest project that we we're, we're wrapping up is uh uh pretty cool. Uh there's a uh organization or a, a subscription service that like millions of physicians across America are subscribed to. It's called Up to Date. And the idea, well, across the world really. But and the idea is 
that each topic has a panel of experts that basically gives doctors the cliff notes on like, what do you need to know about this? How do you know if it's a medication? Like, how do you dose it? What do you need to watch out for? And they're consuming this in like two minute bits. So this guy was like, hey, uh, he's a senior editor for that company. Um, and he's like, why don't you write the thing for uh, for strength training and primary care? And I was like, what? Oh, I guess it's happening now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So yeah, the idea is how like uh, how far can we take this? How how uh, far into the medical mainstream can we take the strength conditioning and uh, legitimate practices and, and get 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 the patients to train? And then how far can we take the sort of uh, uh, medical knowledge into the strength conditioning world where it's you know you've got it, uh, so here here's an interesting thing, and I, I promise I won't go on too many tangents, and if I do, you just wave your hand, wave your arms. But so, so in the United States, uh, roughly half of people, uh, you know, at any given time have high blood pressure. All right. And, and only, you know, less than a third of them are actually properly managed, which so, so now you go into the strength and conditioning world. There's a lot of people with high blood pressure just by definition, because there are a lot of people with poorly managed high blood pressure as it is. So, they there's gonna they're gonna be lifters and and athletes who have elevated blood pressure um and and want to know well can i train with this is this dangerous like what are my risks what do i need to do how would you manage this and the you know your your standard doctor is not necessarily equipped to handle that because they don't even know they not that they don't even know they don't know the response of blood pressure in the cardiovascular system to exercise because they've never been they've never been trained in it and so right. it's not a this isn't like a personal affront to them, like, oh, oh, you stupid doctors. That's not the case. It's just that you know how to manage blood pressure, but this is a special population. And so it doesn't – you're not really prepared uh, you know, to, to manage that. And then second, does the person that you're trying to counsel, do they trust you? Right. So if a lifter comes in, you know, or an athlete comes in and he's like, oh, hey, Dr. Feigenbaum, you know, I've got this high blood pressure deal. And I'm like, and, he, and he's like, I trust you because I saw you deadlift 700 pounds on the Instagram. Now, exactly. I, you know, that's not that's not the greatest way to, like, earn your chops, you know, or, 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 or gain your niche um, in this field. But I think you're trying to meet people where they're at. And if they connect to you or you have this good rapport because you're similar to them, you're also a lifter or you're also involved in the same things they are, then maybe the outcomes are, are likely to be better because they'll, they'll basically trust the information a little bit more. So anyway, that's where we're at now. Now, So now we're, I, I do some consults with, uh, with uh, would-be patients about uh, medical conditions, uh, either to before they start training or while they're training or whatever. And then uh, we're really trying to put out information just to uh, educate people on both sides and sort of see if we can make this a, a little bit healthier place. That's awesome, man. I love that. And I, I do think there is a sort of a disconnect between something like a trainer who is pushing strength training versus a doc who is, you know, trying to eight to 12 minutes pumping through a bunch of patients and, um, you know, it doesn't really uh, have a ton of knowledge in that area. So in your opinion, why do you think that strength strength training isn't prescribed more often in the traditional medical setup? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. And, and there's some evidence here. Uh, so if, if you actually discuss like exercise prescription in general, um, so less than 10% of all primary care doctors at present even know that what the current guidelines are for exercise prescription, which does include two twice weekly resistance training, um, uh, either high intensity interval training uh, or moderate intensity cardio. I mean, the, basically, that's those are the general recommendations. So, less than ten percent even know what they are, and of those ten percent who do know what they are, less than half of them are actually prescribing them. And they're like, "Well, wait, 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 what's the deal?" And so they cite a bunch of things that you would you could probably guess on your own. One is, "Hey, I've never done this before. I like training my or exercise myself. So, how can I?" advise this person how to do it. They cite, you know, lack of personal experience. Uh, the other thing they cite is there's uh, le- uh, not enough time in a given patient visit to actually do these things. And you're like, well, yeah, I don't know what to tell you there. I mean, you're trying, well, cause yeah, at, at some point the way the payer system is set up, you know, you got to kind of churn through these patients. Uh, and that's, that's one part of it. The other part of it is, you know, if a patient comes in and their blood pressure is, you know, 180 over 100, and you're like, hey, you know, this is a serious problem. We need to address that mainly during this visit. And yes, it's true that exercise can be used as an adjunct treatment for high blood pressure. However, I know that I need to assess how big of a problem this really is for you. Is it affecting other organs? Uh, yeah, do I need to start you on a medication? Probably if that's yes. You know, if, if that's if that's a real blood pressure. I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff that you have to get out of the way first before you finally like, hey, there's actually nothing else to talk about. 
besides exercise. And, and I don't love that model, but that's the model we're in right now. You know, so if you came into me and you had a serious medical problem that required me to send away for laboratory uh, evalu- uh, analysis, I need to get labs on you. I needed to prescribe you a medication, counsel you on all the potential side effects, how to take the medication, this, that, and the other, right? And then schedule a follow up. Well, there's our visit right there. Totally. And if I do- and if I don't do that, I'm in trouble from legally. medical legally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. Oh, by the way, there's three other patients that I'm already late for, too, just as an aside. And, and again, I don't love that. That's, I didn't create that model. I'm not pulling the strings. Um, but that that's just the reality of what it is right now. So I can understand. I can empathize with the issues and trying to get to be able to discuss this. But yeah, if you don't, if you've never done it before, it's going to be harder to, to prescribe. If you don't have enough time, that's going to be a barrier, right? And then the other thing that, that they commonly uh, have found when people respond to these questionnaires that ultimately get published is, uh, in, in the research on this stuff, uh, if the doctor is out of shape, they do not like prescribing this stuff at all, which makes sense. But I'd like to just challenge that. I mean, so so by that line of thinking, the best nutritionist, the best uh, strength coach – um, the best nutritionist would be the leanest person or the one with the best, you know, aesthetically pleasing physique. The the best strength coach would be the strongest person. And, and that's not necessarily true, um, although you would like your coach or your practitioner to have gone through the process a little bit. But what about the, the guy or gal who's 60 years old? You know, I mean, at some point, age and, and at every point, genetics come into this and, and, you know, other life choices that may or may not be involved in, in attaining certain, certain performance levels. So I would just, I don't think we need to, I I wish that weren't the case, but in our society, certainly if you, if you have not achieved a high level of performance or, or high, uh, a high uh, status uh, within a certain field, then yeah, you feel less comfortable talking about it, even if you have the knowledge base to do so. Um, so it's it's tough. I I don't know if the fix for it is more education, like like in in medical school. I mean, you're already limited on the amount of time you have. Like, do we just need to pump these people full of nutrition and and training information? I think there are, there are worse options than that. I think it would be useful to have like a toolkit. Um, I think the problem is multifactorial, and then the solution is multifactorial. We need more time. To talk to patients, that could be from like exercise-related patient groups where, hey, so like if you came in and you got diabetes, right? One of the things that you would – and you had diabetes, you, you would be assigned to a group that would – you would meet with peers and then an instructor uh, and they would talk about – what does it mean to have diabetes? What do you need to do because you now have diabetes? What kind of exercise or nutritional choices? And, and those aren't, you know, the information, it is what it is. But that sort of thing for just preventative exercise or nutritional interventions, you know, I think that would be huge, you know. But but who's going to teach it then? But, yeah, it's tricky, man. I mean, it, it seems like the, the system is set up almost to fail and, and the primary care um, is – essentially being done in the gyms and then when it comes to an emergency the doctor is there for yeah. what the doctor should be there for if i get hit by a bus i i want to go to a doc and you know um yeah not put out fires put totally, out fires totally but man. but i think like mid-levels it would be a huge there'd be a huge benefit if pas and nurse practitioners and nurses were were more able to to do this stuff and and, and i think that that's going to come down to more education. You know, the people who end up spending more time with the patients, that's going to be, that's going to be huge. But ultimately what I think we're doing is trying to, okay, we're collecting this information. We're putting it out. We're really trying to just provide resources for people to meet the patient or would be patient where they're at. You know, if you're a trainer and you read our stuff, then now you've got a leg up. You can't prescribe a medication. Okay. So your, your hands are kind of tied in certain places, but you know, if you have read and are familiar with the latest sort of guidelines on what are the lifestyle interventions for high blood pressure, you can provide that information. It's just general information, and you know, with the 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 appropriate amount of caution. Like, hey, if you've never been evaluated by your doctor, you should probably be evaluated by your doctor for this. But you know, in the meantime, here are things just general information. So I'm not suggesting that trainers or gym managers need to start managing <laughs> complex <laughs> disease, disease processes. Disease management. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but I think working together as a team, you know, if uh, if each doc. Each doctor had 10 coaches that he or she could refer to for like just therapeutic exercise. 
I think that would be huge, you know. But yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chris Kresser's work, but he has been teaming up with health coaches, trainers, all that sort of stuff. And the docs have been working all together with them um, in a comprehensive program to get people on the right track and stuff. And I think you're absolutely right, man. Like those two people teaming up, being on the same side, working with each other as opposed to it being so separate, it might be beneficial. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, I mean, it's difficult to imagine a way that it would be harmful outside of just resource. You know, I mean, you know, the scariest thing to me is let's say we had an influx of just money, just all this money comes in and they're like, hey, you want to you want to do this thing? Like, all right, well, let's go. <laughs> oh, crap. Like Donald Trump calls me up, you know, and he's like, hey, man, we have, it's going to be huge. Like, go. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, crap. So so then we, I go do this, right? Uh, so I accumulate a bunch of health uh, professionals who are in the trenches. I'm like, okay, here's our referral network. Here's the process. Here's the, you know, the general uh, position statement on what we want to do in the United States or, or in, in civilized countries. And so here's, here are, here's our action plan and we do it. And then 10 years from now, we have all this data follow up. It's like, you know what? You guys tried and you actually got a good amount of people exercising and, and changing their diet. And they did well uh, uh, from actually complying with the stuff. But it didn't change the progress of certain disease states. And we end up spent, you know, that's the that's the fear. Right. And there was actually an editorial in the British Medical Journal where basically we're like, we are almost 100 percent sure that. You know, exercise and regular physical activity and dietary manipulation, um, that's all going to be good. It's going to improve people's quality of life. They're going to live longer. They're going to spend less money on health care, you know, for managing chronic disease because you're you're just going to improve all these things. But we don't know that for a fact. And so, yeah, the scariest thing would be like, yeah, we did all this stuff. And then at the end, and you're like, eh, didn't really really do anything, which – it seems illogical, but without this, uh, you know, huge uh, uh, retrospective analysis of, of these studies being or, or interventions being done, it's hard to say. Like, yeah, if you uh, if you start exercising twice per day or twice per week, rather, and you change your diet to maintain appropriate body weight, uh, you're very very likely to prevent any sort of disease from ever happening. Totally. You know, we can't. <laughs> yeah, so it's, if that would be a scary thing, I just don't think that it's likely to happen. Uh, well, Donald Trump calling me or <laughs> or the thing failing, but um, but that's uh, that would be the ultimate goal is to have this huge you know referral network and interdisciplinary team to tackle these these problems and and uh, get raise raise the number of people who are uh, inactive and sedentary uh, or lower lower that number significantly to a point where everybody's active, everybody's training, everybody's doing good stuff uh, uh, in the gym and. And and uh, maintaining an appropriate body weight that would be cool. That'd be a cool place to live. So, absolutely, man. Now, shifting gears a little bit back to the strength training stuff, can you just enlighten us on some of the benefits of health of strength training for health and like why should we be doing it? Oh man, do you want to talk about the meaning of life first? Or? <laughs> It's well, a big so, question. so I think, you know, if you go through by systems, and so this is like one of the things we do, we're discussing like a patient's problems, um, whether they're known to them or not. We go through just by organ systems and like, hey, uh, neuro, you know, start neuro and then kind of go down like heart, lungs, stuff like that. So, all right, first let's quantify it. Strength training, I would love it to just be like barbell training, right? I mean, if if you put a gun in my head and said, Jordan, what's the, you know, what should I be doing training wise? I think most of it should revolve around barbell training. So that's squats, deadlifts, presses, bench, you know, stuff like that. But in the literature, it's, this is all just resistance training. So a lot of the stuff, some of it's barbell based, some of it's dumbbell based, some of it's not a, like machine based stuff. Sometimes there's kettlebells involved, whatever. I think resistance training at large you can. There's a a bunch of known benefits. Um, so one is cognitive performance. So uh, performance on standardized tests. Um, there's uh, evidence that it improves GPA in adolescent and college age students. It improves your ability to retain information. It, it reduces the rate of decline for people who have uh, uh, cognitive diseases of aging. So and it improves quality of life in those with existing disease like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stuff like that, basically because it keeps them strong enough to not require as much care or be able to even to live independently in, in some cases. So that's from a neuro standpoint, there's, uh, you know, we can't, we can't move forward without talking about depression, anxiety. There's 
a wealth of evidence that regular exercise uh, can improve both of those things. Um, I haven't seen any evidence on schizophrenia yet in training, but I think there's a, there's maybe some institutional review board issues with getting that getting that passed to run that study, but. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you keep on moving down and you, so you start talking about like cardio respiratory benefits of resistance training. This is probably one of the, the bigger arguing points in, in, in multiple different circles from, from different angles. So people will say, well, resistance training is great, but you have to do cardio. You, resistance training is great, but you have to do cardio. And, and what they're meaning is that there is a certain level, a certain threshold of cardio respiratory fitness that is needed in order to avoid prematurely uh, dying or developing disease processes. And uh, at this point, we know what that level is based based on these large data sets. And, and it's about eight metabolic equivalents. That's like the best technical sort of marker that we have. And most people, when they go from sedentary to uh, trained with the, uh, you know, they've, they've trained even just with barbells, will develop that metabolic capacity they in, in that they won't actually need additional cardio to meet that threshold. Some people won't. It's going to be a small uh, uh, fraction of folks, and those would be effectively non, you know, neither non-responders or poor responders to resistance training in general. Those folks would actually need additional cardiorespiratory training to meet that threshold, that minimum threshold. But right now, the evidence is suggested that most folks are going to meet that threshold, so that uh, uh, that metabolic uh, uh, equivalent threshold with just resistance training. Um, the cardiologists and some doctors will say, well, yeah, but, uh, you know, since when you resistance train, your blood pressure goes up, which is true. Acutely, uh, yeah. 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 You're going to get, um, you're going to get uh, a thickened left vent- ventricle. You're left going to get left ventricular hypertrophy, which is true, but this is an adaptive response. And the best data to date suggests that it is a different type of hypertrophy than you see in people with high blood pressure in that this is an adaptive response. You also get an increased amount of elasticity in the uh, 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 arterial system, meaning that this is adaptive. So basically, I mean, we've seen blood pressures in the 400 systolic. So that's the top number. So we're talking like 400s over 120, 150 during a, a heavy squat in somebody. So you're like, Oh shit, that's a lot. But it's for a, a short period of time, and then the adaptive response of the body is: let's tolerate this. Let's figure out a way to tolerate this safely. And so you get a handful of changes with that. Now, the most interesting thing when it comes to the cardiovascular system, when, when people say that line is: well, your blood pressure goes up every time that you exercise. Like if you went for a brisk walk, guess what happens to your blood pressure? Goes up. You know. So. So, so that line, I mean, does it go up to the same amount? Well, no. The more muscle mass you use, in just as a general rule, your blood pressure goes up more. Okay, so uh, an arm ergometer, where you're just like pedaling a bike with your arms, raises your blood pressure a little less than if you were doing a, a like a sprint, which involves way more muscle mass, and you're producing more force that way. So. Blood pressure goes up more in sprinting. Now, if you add an isometric component to the exercise, so uh, like you're bracing really hard under a squat or you're doing even a hand grip, like that that test raises your blood pressure a bunch because it actually clamps down on the blood vessels. So you get this resultant elevated blood pressure. Uh, but they all lower your blood pressure at rest. If you go from untrained to trained, your blood pressure goes down a few points. And if you have high blood pressure before that, guess what? Your blood pressure goes down even a little bit more. So, you know, it does aerobic exercise lower your blood pressure more than resistance training? Not really, unless there's concomitant weight loss. So if you lose weight, more weight with cardio than resistance training, which is possible because if you do more volume of it, you expend more energy, you know, all these all these sorts of things, then sure, yeah, you can lose, you can you can correct your blood pressure a little bit better, but it's not the cardio necessarily. So um, other other cool things. I don't have anything from like a a, a, a pulmonary standpoint. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we're <laughs> We don't have well, to get that well other that. than your VO2 max, you know, people will say your VO2 max doesn't improve when you train. It does a little bit, but it's not, you know, substantial because the cardiorespiratory demands for resistance training are not that great unless you're really, really undertrained. Does that make sense? Yeah. So part of meeting that metabolic threshold equivalent that we're talking about requires you to, you know, you have to you breathe a little harder, your heart rate goes up, all this other sort of stuff. And the the more sedentary or less trained you were before that. All right, the uh, uh, the more adaptation you're going to have from the training. But if you were like super, you know, super fit, nothing's going to happen. Your VO2 max. Um, 
Other benefits from the musculoskeletal system, obviously, increase lean body mass, uh, decrease waist circumference. Both of those usually co-occur in people who are previously sedentary, which is good because the abdominal uh, fat content is that's bad. That's general badness. <laughs> I mean, also, you know, people have heard belly fats. The, that's the dangerous one. And, it, and it, it's true. And in fact, BMI tends to be non-predictive uh, most of the time in isolation um, for people developing diseases associated with elevated body fat levels. So we use BMI, body mass index, as this sort of tool to, te- to rapidly screen without any real test besides, hey, what's your height? What's your weight? We use this tool to say, oh, well, you, you're carrying too much body fat, so you're gonna you're at risk for all these other diseases. That's what we use it for. It's not very sensitive or specific um, to, to really help your management and, and which is why we always add in a waist circumference afterwards. So it's your BMI and a waist circumference, and those two things really, really help the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Uh, and so, having a, a elevated waist circumference in and of itself is is a is an issue. And so, resistance training has been shown to even in the absence of weight loss, decrease your waist circumference more than cardio, which is cool. Um, increasing lean body mass is huge, huge uh, uh, for multiple reasons. It improves your ability to tolerate to deal with sugar, which so folks who have metabolic problems like diabetes, that's that's going to be a big deal too. It's going to improve their ability to do the activities of daily life, uh, not suffer the slow, slow, painful death that's associated with sarcopenia. I mean, uh, aging well requires you to be physically robust enough to tolerate that, and, and so that's which is why survival data looks the way it does for people over the age of 65. The, if your BMI is elevated and you're over the age of 65, you do better than if your BMI is normal. And it's because you carry more lean body mass, one, one of the reasons, and you're less fragile. So, um, And then uh, the thing that uh, everybody else will talk about is obviously bone mineral density. So being able to, yeah, loading yourself, that's going to that's gonna be super useful. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of benefits. You, you can't really, you know, head to toe, Resistance training is 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 helpful. That doesn't mean it's always more helpful than cardio, you know, the class, what we classically call cardio. But but there is no way to train or to develop increased amount of lean body mass and bone mineral density through conditioning alone. You we need to lift things. We need to produce force uh, against our external environment in order to to um, uh, kind of complete our entire human existence like right, to, right. to to, to, to <laughs> live our best physiologically life. yeah 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 so anyway that's i don't i probably just talked for 10 minutes no man that was that was a huge question and a brilliant breakdown so i really <laughs> appreciate that now first and foremost i guess you're recommending folks hey if you're going to do something lift some weights um i would say secondarily are you getting people to be more active in general or are you just saying hey um, outside of strength training, do something that you enjoy, keep moving, or how do you parse that sort of second piece out? Yeah, I mean, it's context dependent because, you know, uh, if a person, if it's a young person who's a competitive athlete, you know, who's practicing a sport or, you know, let's say they're a powerlifter, then, you know, their their needs are different than the 60 year old lady who's never done anything before, right? So, but for the general population, my, I, I know that. Being more active on a daily basis is associated with them having decreased amount of, of body fat, right? They, and, and and their overall morbidity of disease and and, and premature death are going to go down um, the more active they are. So I do encourage them to be quote unquote more active. With the, the thing is, I never say those words. Yeah, just be more active because right. it's it's not specific enough to be actionable. And they're like, well, what the fuck does that mean? I'm like, yeah, I don't know either. So so I try to be very specific with their prescription. I want you to resistance train three times a week. Now, the that's my like default recommendation. Now, if the person's uh, uh, carrying too much body fat, then I'm going to also have the include conditioning recommendations, and I'll either start them at once, one or two times a week of like formal conditioning. Like, hey, I want you to go to the gym. You're going to get on the recumbent bike, and you're going to do, uh, you know, intervals. Here's your deal. Now you're going to do steady state, and here's the here's your here are your targets for that, for instance, and, and make sure that they understand. Um, and then the final, more general recommendation is, hey, every day I want you to get out and do some activity. It doesn't need to be formal. You don't need to track your heart rate. You don't need whatever. You just need to do it for 30 minutes, for instance, or 60. You know, it just depends on a person. But that's the general recommendation, not just, hey, just move a little more. 
And we're like, well, what, <laughs> what does that mean? It's you know, too so, vague. Yeah. 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 So you know, if it's gardening, if it's going for a walk, if it's, uh, you know, cycling leisurely, like, so I wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't consider those like the formal conditioning things. Because again, if you're getting on your bike and you're just tooling around town, right. It's just not, the effort is not sustained enough to cause the stress that I, that I want to occur in, in really any case, you know, even the person who just needs to who's starting training. So, um, yeah, I, the, the, just, yeah, just do a little more. I, uh, it annoys me so much. <laughs> now outside of that, uh, the formal conditioning piece, are you asking people to hit a general step count sort of thing or just, <clears throat> are you tracking that stuff? No, I mean, I, so I think, well, all right, let me back up. Some people are geeked out. They got, look, man, I've got my Fitbit and it's synced to my iPhone and it's synced to the cloud and the cloud is all and they They love it. Like that's the thing. And if that's going to improve their compliance with their general recommendation, I am pro that. Uh, that being said, I very rarely, if I ever say, look, I want you to do 10,000 steps today, 12,000, you know, whatever. I just don't. Um, my, my thing is that, um, uh, I have not seen very good results with the daily step count unless it also coincided with a physical activity, uh, a sort of threshold. So, so the general recommendation is that you need to move, you need to be out, be active for like 60 minutes a day. And so if you had someone journal that with the steps, I think you're going to see a tighter correlation between the, the physical activity and overall like trend of like their weight, for instance, than the, the steps, um, and God, I just hate wearable tech. I just, I can't, I just, I can't. And I, there was one nurse's study that they did. They wore, a, they gave half the nurses the Fitbit. Um, I actually might've been the Microsoft band. I, I don't want to like get sued on this cause they're gonna be like, Oh, it's the wrong one. You, you slander. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the people who had the wearable tech gained more weight within the period of time. Now both groups gained weight, which is funny, uh, cause it was a weight loss study. <laughs> Wow. Okay. <laughs> they were like encouraging. It was like a it was like a health initiative. They were like, yeah, we're gonna get you people active, we'll lose some weight. But the people that had the wearable tech ended up gaining more weight. So I was like, well, maybe the whole counseling thing was is is more important than the uh, the tech aspect of this, you know. But um, yeah, I, as a, a funny unrelated story, uh, we were in New Zealand hiking around. This guy took us up the side of a mountain. He's like, oh, it's a really easy hike, and I'm like cool man so i had a few beers beforehand because i'm on vacation whatever yeah and we get like 30 minutes into this thing and i'm i'm and this is not an easy hike now i don't know if this is magnified by the fact that i had like some adidas like nmds on and i'm just <laughs> i go hey man did you said this is an easy hike he goes oh yeah totally a lie I, but you wouldn't have came if i had told you it was really hard and i was like well why did you, you drink these beers so anyway, um, yeah, this was like a super long hike up the side of two mountains. I mean, it was beautiful. It ended up being great. Uh, but my my iPhone told me that I had 45,000 steps that day. Like 40 – when I was like, that's insane. I, we trained that night. I pulled 595 for a set of six. So I was like, nah, this step thing's bullshit. I don't need – I don't need <laughs> I mean, That's like a PR in like lifetime steps. But yeah, anyway. 45 so uh, is a lot. That is a lot of steps. It's a lot. Yeah, I, I probably didn't get rabdo. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I so my clientele is not they strength train, but probably not nearly as much as your clientele. And I find that nutrition and step counts, like if people get those things paired up, the general movement via steps is like magic. If somebody oh. hits, you know, an eight to ten k, something like that, like it's really solid. And then if I see them in the, you know, two to three k range, it's like, okay, you didn't leave your house today. Um, but I guess you know, you got to meet the person where they're at, and it depends if somebody is lifting a lot more, then they're burning a lot more calories that way too. Well, yeah, but, but you know, I I would be curious to know if you know the people who aren't meeting the step count are also not being relatively non-compliant with the nutrition thing too. I mean, you totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that's the way really the re- big reason I use exercise is like a, a recommendation with just weight, straight up weight loss folks. You know, I, there's somebody, there's an exercise scientist somewhere, right, in his parents' basement who's like, you guys know that exercise doesn't cause weight loss, right? Like, he's just rocking back and forth. He's triggered, you know. He's like, you guys know that, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, 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 we got it. But, but, but the way that I do see it working very well is as an adjunctive tool for boosting compliance to nutritional strategies. And that's in addition to the other, like, 
quality of life and, and, and benefits outside of just weight loss. So, um, the people I can get to train and be compliant with the training are more, I mean, in general, they do better with the nutrition, especially when they, the, the rate of results are, are relatively high. You know, they're like, Oh, I'm getting stronger. My waist size is going down. You know, that's just like a positive feedback loop. Whereas if you're just like, you know, just eat, eat this here and you give them very specific, but nothing else. Some people will, will do fine with that, but usually you require a few other positive changes that all support each other, you know? So whether that's attending certain group meetings, I mean, that's why I like Weight Watchers can be super effective that holds them compl- uh, 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 accountable, but, or you have a, you have a step goal. And so like, okay, I have two things to do today. I have to hit my nutrition and I hit my steps. And you're like, I did both those things. Cool. That's like, you know, you're depositing in your physical, physical 401k for the day. I did a good job. But, uh, I think, I think if you don't have multiple behaviors that are changing, that are co-support each other, it's difficult to isolate just, you know, yeah, just do this one, this one weird trick. It's like, well, yeah, this one weird trick is just eat less. But I mean, unfortunately that, that, that hasn't really been good advice. So you usually got to do more than one thing, crank more than one lever to get a, an improvement, uh, in, in people. Yeah, I totally agree, man. And, and the research does show that exercise isn't necessarily essential for losing the weight to begin with, but weight maintenance long or weight 100%. loss maintenance long term is so important, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be a statistic because because if you if you're like everybody else, you're going to be over 90 at five years, 90 percent of you are going to gain back the weight, you know, so, or, or it's, something, it's it's a grim statistic. Um, yeah, it's so, early. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at the American Weight Loss Registry and then the uh, the sort of the most common things that they do. So, yeah, they eat breakfast on a regular basis. They track either their food or their calories or their weight. If they have some like daily objective accountable that's the thing, the thing that's holding them accountable, they spend are usually active more than, you know, uh, 60 minutes per day. They uh, on average uh, don't watch that much TV like Okay, these are like the things that 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 again, the exercise scientist, or whatever in this parent space would say. That's bro science, man. It doesn't mean anything. It's like, yeah, well, the largest sort of retrospective analysis we have on people who are successful dieters actually show that that stuff, those behavioral modifications can can work. Even though, yeah, it's true, you could just eat one meal a day. Okay, you, you could do that, uh, and you you sit on your couch. I mean, it, theoretically, I guess, but you know, it's it's highly likely that's not going to work out long term. Totally. Totally, yeah. man. So where do you see the future of medicine going, for example? Do you think more docs are going to come and start moving online and get out of the bricks and mortar setup doing something more like you're doing? Or how do you see this stuff playing out long term? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, well, I, I know that all of the large medical, like, groups are really pushing this sort of portal communication. And what I mean by that is like, oh, you can online like send your doc emails or, you know, texts, but through this portal. And and I know on the provider side, these most most docs are like, man, this is like now I gotta do this too. Like I already spend ninety percent of my time charting, only ten percent seeing patients. Totally. Uh unless unless you're a surgeon, in which case you spend more time cutting. Uh but and now you've got this other thing that you got to do, and it's all about patient satisfaction scores, which inversely correlate with patient outcomes, which is kind of funny, just as a uh, an aside. But yeah. <laughs> I think that what you're going to see is honestly more, more of the same. I, I don't think that people are going to be. It, it, here's what you're asking: if, if is it likely that students, right, who are the future of healthcare now? Um, that, they're, that those who are acquiring increasing amounts of debt are going to, after a residency, when the interest is continued to accrue on all of their student loans, say, you know what? Instead of joining this like medical model, like that's existing one that I know already so well that I have a job offer that's you know going to put me out out of debt in in in, a, in in some years and is stable. Should I just like do my own thing without any business training, without any additional skills because I've dedicated my entire life to medicine? I don't see that happening unless the payer model changes or rewards peop- that, that a sort of change. So there's already uh, like outcome-based uh, payer models out there where like, oh, hey, if your patients on average lose you know, this amount of weight or you prevent them from developing these you know, uh, uh, disease processes uh, down the line because you're good on the front end, like you'll get, you get a bonus. Like there, that model is out there. I think if that becomes widespread, you're going to see a change in sort of how clinicians go about their their business. Um, but 
most of the folks who do the online stuff uh, or concierge medicine in general are old timers. You know, and so apologies to all the all the folks listening to this who are like, "Yo, man, I'm I'm not that old." I'm like, I, "Look, I got I got you." But they they either had an in clientele base that they were like, "Oh, if I'm seeing on average 2,500 patients a year and I take 300 of them with me and they all pay me a retainer fee per year, then I can live." You know, and I I see less patients. But if you're fresh out of a residency, you can't do that. You don't have any patients, and now you got a and now you got the overhead of a building too. Telemedicine, um, where you're seeing people just via Skype or, or, or Zoom or, or whatever is attractive, but you have to find a way to get your market. And so, again, I think that you're going to see there with the age of social media, there's a rise of young professionals who are going to have their, their markets, and that's going to be an option for them. But you know, of the thousands of graduates every year, I think that's still a very small percentage. Um, I think it could be super useful. I mean, there's data sh- suggesting that online, like, you know, coaching program programs work for weight loss and fitness and stuff like that. And this would be huge, particularly if uh, doctors are involved. But I think the medical system has to change a little more um, or on a larger scale to allow to allow a, a big change to happen in how we practice medicine. I know yeah. that's like self self influential. It's just, ah, man. I don't know. On the other hand, on the other hand, you know, maybe uh, Baraki, Dr. Baraki and I, we're, uh, maybe we just crush it. You know, we're already doing pretty well, but maybe we just maybe we crush it a little, a little, make it make it a little more big time. You know, uh, and we give people an option because the the whole idea with barbell medicine was from from the inception was let's have a business model where we can coach, we can doctor and we can tie these things together get better health outcomes spend less money overall than the traditional than the traditional system right but let's have this business model and then make enough money so where it's worthwhile to go into primary care versus going into cardiothoracic surgery right where you're you're spending 100 hours a week working and you never see your, your family uh shout out to all my cardiothoracic surgeons out there but who aren't listening to this because they don't have, <laughs> they don't have time yeah <laughs> but the idea was let's make primary care uh, available to the best and brightest from a business standpoint and from like an altruistic standpoint. So, what one of the things we're working on is like uh, how do we how do we have this business model? How do we put it into like hey here's the business model like here's the you can read through this you can do this you can come spend some time with us and figure out how we how we do what we do and then you can just do it like open source it. I don't want to franchise it. I, I don't need that. But I would like if there are more people like us and more centers like uh, the what we're going to get into uh, out there. If there's a thousand you know locations where you can go uh, where there's trainers and coaches in the back because the gym's attached to the deal, and you know you have your your well trained medical professional there as you need them. That's cool for me. I love that. Uh, that's that's what I think. Some something outside of the existing medical system is going to change that is going to make is make the change it's not going to be from within it's not going to be through well we're just going to refine 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 no it's going to be something that makes them change right it's like uh, and so maybe that's us maybe it's something else maybe i don't know but if at any point you hear yeah you know just go do some more squats from your doctor then you'll know we've made it. Like you know that, <laughs> like this has happened. The the revolution has has, has happened. Yeah, man, I totally agree. I think that it's going to be some different system. But if there is something that is appealing enough for people graduating, coming out, and being able to make that stuff work, like you guys are, um, I, I I could see that working. Yeah, yeah. It's just and and again, the the social media stuff has been. It's just it well. Everything that's online has been doing better because of social media, right? Like, or is more exposed anyway. So, you know, if there's 10,000 people every year who end up matriculate, who go into medical school, right? And now they're exposed to, well, yeah, these guys on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, they're doctors and they're doing this and they went primary care and wow, that looks awesome, man. I want to do that. Then maybe instead of going into urology, what? Well, need urologists but you know the the reason why that's a competitive field to go into is because they make a bunch of money and they're very you know the, the schedule is nice maybe they go into primary care and they're like yeah let's just let's, let's do some preventative lifestyle medicine like that would be cool and oh yeah by the way here's the business model which you don't have for any other specialty right now right you best case scenario is you graduate residency you sign a contract to to with an existing medical group and you, you try to make your way but i'd like to just say hey 
what you're going to need to do is do this, this, and this from a marketing standpoint. Do this, this, and this from a building, you know, uh, like actual brick and mortar kind of standpoint. And this, this, and this needs to be your online presence. And hey, go go kill it. Like that's that that's what I'd love to be. You know. Yeah, Join that'd be great. <laughs> All right, Jordan, as we start to wrap up here, man, where can folks learn more about you, the stuff you're doing with Barbell Medicine, um, and everything that you're offering, as well as your social handles and all that good stuff? Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, you can find me on Instagram, Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine. Uh, You can find us on YouTube, the channel's Barbell Medicine. Try to update that uh, weekly with some new content. A website's barbellmedicine.com. If you want to yell at me about my terrible grammar, I already know, so save that. But anything else, you want to shout out? It's uh, info at barbellmedicine dot com, and yeah, I think that's I think that's all. That's how you get in touch with me. Awesome, man. Well, I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thanks so much for taking the time, coming on, and dropping some knowledge on us today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Appreciate it. I'll catch you guys on the next episode.